Please welcome our very distinguished speaker, Associate Professor Tim Pruner. Thank you all uh, for being here. I'm so glad to have the chance to do this event in person. People, my friends in other countries have said to me, wow, you're presenting your book in person. Uh, what a luxury. They're imagining space suits or some self-contained <laughs> hamster ball that you'd roll into the classroom on, right? So um, yeah, so this is fantastic. Um, looking around the room, I see friends, I see family, uh, I see students, colleagues, uh, uh, even a neighbor. Uh, uh, and I'm very grateful to Dean Matthew, to Penny for that, uh, for that generous introduction and, and a highly substantive one as well. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, I feel like in a way I could just leave. Um, I think <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, that's been really terrific. Um, and I'm excited to launch Tyranny of Greed, uh, Trump, Corruption, and the Revolution to Come with all of you. Uh, this is the very first event about this book, which was published in August, uh, just a couple of months ago by Stanford University Press. I'd like to make uh, an official announcement about Trump's first term in office and the upcoming election, which in the United States is on the 3rd of November. And I quote, this election is a decision between preserving America and eliminating everything that we love. For decades, ruling class leaders in both parties sold out our future to China, to faceless corporations and to self-serving lobbyists. They did it to preserve their own power and enrich themselves, all while rigging the system to hold down good middle-class patriots striving to build a family and pursue a decent life. All of this changed dramatically in 2015 when a billionaire named Donald Trump put his own life of luxury on the line. From the moment he came down that famous escalator, he started a movement to reclaim our government from the rotten cartel of insiders that have been destroying the country. We may not have realized it at the time, but Trump is the bodyguard of Western civilization. Whoosh. Anyone feel that, that subtle move into an alternative reality? Right. This is a parallel universe we're living in, and it continues like this. We will build a future where America remains, wait for it, the greatest country ever to exist in the history of the world. And all of that is within our grasp if we secure four more years for the defender of Western civilization, President Donald J. Trump. That was the very first speaker at the Republican National Convention, in case you hadn't quite worked that out yet. Um, now, wow, you know, parallel universes, I would say, if Trump is the defender of Western civilization, then Western civilization must be a project of racial subjugation. Western civilization must be a project of inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality. It must be a project of sexual assault. That's what Western civilization must be about. A, a, a place of constant lies and manipulation, of authoritarian moves against the rule of law and human rights, and of course, of personal enrichment against the public good and for the private interest. And if reelecting Trump is what would make America the greatest country to ever exist in the history of the world, then a nation's greatness must be measured by the wealth of its leaders. It must be measured by the will to power of those leaders against accountability, against rules, against democratic norms and values. And it must be measured by their ability to harass, divide, and oppress the people. That's what the greatness of a nation must be measured by. Now, when I look around the room tonight, uh, I see a group of people who I don't think would live in that alternative universe even for a moment. Uh, but I might be wrong, and that's okay too. But I want to touch base with the audience a little bit about how strange that must feel, right? To hear that quote from the Republican National Convention, having seen everything that we've seen. And so I just wanted to touch base with you all about that. Who in the room, just by a show of hands, has felt, oh, I don't know, even mildly concerned by Trump's rise to power? Or his regime. <laughs> anyway, okay. So I'm not I'm not going crazy here. Beyond mild concern, has anyone felt something stronger like outrage? Okay. So half to three quarters of the room. And now, over the years, as Trump has avoided accountability, 
and consolidated his power and redesigned the Republican Party around his prerogatives and his style of government, if you can call it that. I think some of us have experienced something beyond concern and beyond um, outrage, which would be more along the lines of depression, fatigue, anxiety, despair, hopelessness. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this one, but I want to check in with you all about that um, because I think those are natural human responses to such a constant flow of hatred, jealousy, paranoia, pride, greed. I mean, essentially the seven deadly sins if you really go into it, right? But we're getting all of that in the United States and, you know, and around the world we're getting it too from the government of the most powerful democracy in the world. And I'm not one to go around the room saying most popular, or most powerful democracy in the world. I'm not a big nationalist, but I mean, descriptively speaking, it's the most powerful democracy in the world. Culturally speaking, it's the most powerful democracy in the world. I would, I would hazard a guess, okay? So it's strange and disconcerting and depressing and outrageous to get those essentially sins transmuted onto a government and all of the military, cultural, and political might of the United States of America. Now, so because most of us are committed to democracy, to equality, to civility, to the rule of law, you know, here we are at a law school, right? Because we're committed to these other norms and values, I think that we might find ourselves repulsed by Trump. And I think that you might notice it sometimes within you that there's a voice in there that says things aren't supposed to be like this. There's something there that's coming out, right? If you really get in touch with yourself about this, if you're committed to those values, integrity, civility, the rule of law, human rights, equality, decency, I think you'll find there's a voice in there. Uh, so things are not supposed to be like this. Now, <laughs> I promise we'll get to a hopeful place uh, before we leave. But I would say that that little voice isn't confined just to Trump's regime. That little voice of things aren't supposed to be like this isn't confined just to the United States of America and just to the 2015 campaign through the present moment. It's, it's bigger than that. Uh, things weren't supposed to be like this. So this new century of ours, right? It arrived on the heels of one of the greatest political revolutions in human history, which was the globalization of democracy. By 1989, in the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was only about one third of the nation's political, uh, sorry, of the world's political systems that were democratic, only about one third. And yet a mere 10 years later, by the turn of the century, it was two thirds of the world's nations that had become at least electoral democracies and we're working on things like free press, civil rights, rule of law, and so on. So there's this incredible shift um, that went on at the turn of the century, and it gave, ra gave way to so much optimism that this political scientist who is now just a cliche named Francis Fukuyama coined the phrase, the end of history. Well, maybe he's, let's not say he's a cliche. His phrase has become uh, so overused, right? The end of history. But what he meant by that, what Fukuyama meant by that, and I met him once at a bus at a marine base in Rhode Island, which was a fun conversation. He's a bit of a right-wing guy, actually. Um, so, you know, I had to meet him at the Naval War College. But so, you know, what does he mean by the end of history? It's really profound. He means a progression kind of like this. Um, so for thousands of years, political authority was conditioned on your status in a religious hierarchy, right? The word of God was the law, of course, as interpreted by a select class, a narrow hierarchy of people, okay? So there was this sort of what we would call today oppression or domination, a lot of us, okay? I don't wanna be uh, sort of categorical about this, but let's say in an old school sense, theocracy was pretty, pretty extreme in an old school sense. Um, monarchy and aristocracy, again, for thousands of years, political power was conditioned not on the people or the popular will or public participation or anything like that, status in a royal hierarchy, right? Uh, violent conquest, family lineage, titles, birth, right? So for a long time, things worked like that. And then there were a bunch of dictatorships, of course, across the world that conditioned political power on military might, 
on this sort of bizarre, um, really uh, hard to put your finger on transmission process where this one dictator knew what the will of the people was and could bring it about through his power and might and wisdom, right? Military, uh, military control. And then here's the part that you know, is most directly related to Fukuyama. Of course, the condition for political power, the criteria for political power around much of the world prior to 1989 was your status in the Communist Party it was a one-party state, right? It was an authoritarian version of communism. Um, so political power vested there. And when communism finally fell, that's when Fukuyama said, well, hey, history was over. You know, like all of these structural forms of oppression and domination of the masses were over. All of these ideologies that said some people are infinitely wise and should rule the masses because they're in touch with God, because they have honor and, and, and royalty or what have you, right? All of those ideologies came crashing down, says Fukuyama, and we lived in a new era, the end of ideological conflict and this what was supposed to be a golden age for government, uh, let's say something like freedom, equality, and self-government for all, right? That kind of thing. Um, okay, so there was that golden age kind of theory. The problem is, and here's why I'm trying to tie it to things aren't supposed to be this way, is that that theory of the end of history didn't really last for long, in my view. Um, if you check in with organizations like Freedom House, NGOs across the world, if you look at the state of the media, the state of rule of law, the integrity of elections, uh, you'll see a general pattern of democratic decline. Uh, so, you know, the supposed end of history was definitely premature. Um, democracies are not holding up very well. They're under threat. Um, one of the main pro produce, really, of these liberal democracies, this liberal democratic model that spread across the world, one of its greatest products is tremendous economic inequality. Now, of course, there are success stories, and of course, there are improvements over the gulag or what have you, okay? I'm, again, I'm not trying to be totally categorical about this, but I'm trying to say there's still a flaw there somewhere. And that kind of inequality where the top 1% of the world uh, in terms of total wealth holders own about half of the wealth, that's not a very sustainable model across the globe. And um, it's leading, among other things, it's one of the causes that's leading to rising illiberal populism. You know, Trump's not alone. I mean, he might be uh, an especially extreme example and one of the most colorful of all the illiberal authoritarians across the world, but he's not the only one. Uh, you can go to Brazil, Poland, Hungary. Um, you can look at political party uh, seats in Italy. Um, to a lesser extent, the Leave campaign, but some of the tactics the Leave campaign used, the voters they targeted, the messaging they used, it's from the same playbook. And the demographics of the voters of these groups is often highly similar across countries. So there's that trend going on. And then need I remind you uh, that we may be going from that figurative end of history to a literal one, right? If, if liberal democracy is such a just uh, form of government where reason and participation and uh, arguments based on the merits and evidence is carrying the day, then why on earth would we be committing suicide as a species? Why on earth would we be entering an era of mass extinctions, food shortages, mass migration, natural disasters? Uh, why on earth would we be doing that? Uh, there's got to be something else going on there. Um, and so, you know, things aren't supposed to be like this is also a natural human response to the 21st century. Okay, there are people you can read to feel good. If you need a, a cheer me up pill, read Steven Pinker or someone like that, okay? There are arguments that we're improving in certain ways, and it's true. But in a broad sense, all right, the climate crisis, that's unprecedented. And we may not make it in any form that's cognizable and happy and just to us, and for posterity especially. Right? We may not make it at this stage because of this. Now, OK, same sentiment of things aren't supposed to be that way. It also applies to the United States of America. Um, got a little list here. Uh, similar to the end of history, there was a triumphant sense in the United States, I would say, with the culmination of the civil rights movement. Uh, so the first 200 years, basically, there was a triumphant sense that the country was moving towards greater political equality and greater popular participation and a greater sense of political inclusion, right? 
And if you, in, in the, from a big picture perspective, of course, uh, Dean Matthew rightly pointed out the country was founded on slavery. There's the original sin, and there's many others. But the direction of change was positive, right? So, I mean, just to begin with, you know, def so defeating the most powerful empire on earth in the name of, of elections and uh, the Declaration of Independence sorts of values, that's a pretty big thing to do. So 1776, then, of course, there's suffrage. Um, eventually for white males without property who couldn't vote at first. So white males without property get the vote through Jacks the Jacksonian democracy period. There's the abolition of slavery. There's due process and equal protection. Uh, there's African-American suffrage, popular election of U.S. senators. Women get the vote. Um, uh, Americans of Indian, uh, sorry, they call it the Indian Citizenship Act. And Native Americans get the vote. Chinese immigrants get the vote. The poll taxes are abolished, and eventually, right at the sort of towards the end of this trajectory, 1964, 1965, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Acts are passed. So, uh, you know, cracking down um, on literacy tests, poll taxes, and other obstacles designed to keep especially minorities away from the polls. Those acts are then enforced finally in the 19, early 1970s. So the United States becomes a democracy, by my calculation, in the early 1970s. And so, you know, you'd think, great, we made it. As a political community, it was hard. There were a lot of mistakes around, along the way, oh, the Civil War, other things. But hey, not that it was a mistake, but that it was unfortunate that it had to be fought, right? Um, so however, um, we still come to the same place that we came on the global level. So around 2014, we start to get these wake-up calls from leaders in their field. On the left, uh, the economist Thomas Piketty at the Paris School of Economics. On the right, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page. Piketty looks at the United States. From that period where democracy was finally completed, 1970s to 2010, he finds four decades of rising economic inequality to the point at which the United States becomes the most unequal of all advanced democracies with the top 10% capturing 72% of total wealth, bottom 50% of the population, 180 something million, I think, uh, owning just 2%, 2% of total wealth, practically 200 million people, all right? Piketty says, uh, well, hey, um, levels of inequality this high tend to lead to violent revolution historically, so watch out, America. Piketty says, levels of inequality this high aren't natural, much less inevitable, but rather the product of law and policy. Like capital concentration this bad is the product of law and policy. It's not an accident. It's not that the, br the brightest and the best and the most industrious are just working harder and having better ideas. Give me a break, okay? It's essentially his 600 page <laughs> book and then give me a break, America. No, it's, it's much bigger than that. Anyway, uh, and then on the right, um, these gentlemen, uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, say, oh yeah, uh, law and policy are serving to concentrate wealth in the upper classes. Go figure, because from our statistical analysis of about 2,000 issues at the federal level, we conclude that organized interest groups and wealthy individuals have a high degree of influence over parties and elected officials, whereas mass-based interest groups and ordinary Americans have little to no independent influence. In other words, if, if the poor and the middle classes get their way, it's a coincidence, and it's that those with real political power didn't oppose them, essentially. Uh, you can read these pieces. Um, so that's not exactly good news, right? Um, and then you, if you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, you start to say, well, you know, all right, so our electoral framework of nominal complete voting, nominal, complete participation has led to a bunch of inequality, but we did make progress in all other ways, right? No. I mean, some progress, but there's still systemic racial injustices and systemic forms of, well, widespread sexual assault, widespread gender discrimination, widespread killing of innocent African-American youth and some adults too. Um, it's just, it, it kind of blows one's mind, I would think. And all of this, of course, was before Trump. So that sense, right, of things weren't supposed to be like this isn't just Trump. But then, you know, <laughs> at that key moment for the world, for democracy on a global level, that key urgent moment for democracy in the United States, it's interesting that that's the moment where 
the first African-American president who's a civic organizer, who's a constitutional law professor, who's a hopeful and inspirational person. Um, I go into that, I go into all this stuff in the book if you want citations and better descriptions. But the point is, is wow, things really aren't supposed to be this way at that critical time to choose a leader like that. So uh, that was the feeling I started with when I wrote this book. Um, that's, you know, that was my default position. I would wake up every morning between five and six and do a couple hours of writing. And I felt that there was a descent into hell that was going on. Again, those seven deadly sins, right, that are embodied so perfectly by someone who's commanding the full might of the most powerful democracy in the world. It felt like a descent into hell for everyone who cares about democracy, the rule of law, human rights, etc. It was a descent into hell. And I had these times that, that really felt hopeless. You know, I thought to myself, what, you know, what can I really say about the underlying causes of this guy's rise to power? What can I say about the true nature of his political regime? What can I say about how ordinary people could effectively oppose him and strengthen and revitalize democracy? What can I say about that when we're heading into hell? You know, there's just no leverage down here. Um, as Penny mentioned, the, the book is shaped by readings of a lot of really old texts. Um, and one of them is Dante's Inferno. You know, I looked and I thought, well, how would uh, an old Italian political philosopher and um, poet describe hell? You know, and one of the things that I found, which is really where the book came from, was this inscription. This is the famous part on the opening to hell um, where uh, Dante himself and, and Virgil uh, go in. And everyone knows this part. Abandon all hope ye who enter here. That was me <laughs> at the start of this process of research. Um, but that's not the end of the sign. The sign continues and uh, it goes on and it says about hell. Justice moved my great maker in my design. I was created by the primal love, wisdom supreme and potency divine which to me meant that even the worst things we were seeing and experiencing had a cause behind them and that they might be part of a, of a larger plan. And I don't mean a larger sort of religious plan because there's a lot of theories about that in Trump, right? He's the new King David whose imperfections are bringing about uh, a new reign of heaven on earth. You know, that's, there's a lot of bizarre, I don't mean that. I got hope from Dante's idea that there's cause and effect. In other words, if you end up in hell, there's probably a reason for that in Dante's world. And if you're in hell and you don't confront why you're there, you're never gonna get out of it. And there's a, there's, a, there's a systematic plan for these things. And if you avoid what you've done, if you rationalize what you've done, uh, if you defend and justify what you've done, you're never getting out, right? So I tried to lay all that down, you know, and I tried to look in a different way at Trump, and I actually decided to treat him as a teacher. That was when I made the decision to stop treating Trump as my enemy and to start treating Trump as my, my teacher, in a sense of my guide to why the world is the way that it is. Um, so cause and effect, right? Here's just a couple of things, you know, so we went through that progression with democracy at the international level, where there's rising inequality, there's rising environmental catastrophe and climate change, um, there's rising illiberal populism, right? Well, what, and, and that this end of history wasn't an end at all, it was sort of a, a, a beginning of history. Somehow we missed some other step. Um, beginning of history, democracy unfinished, so what am I getting at with there? No sooner do two thirds of the world's democracies become uh, sorry, two-thirds of the world's nations, no, no sooner do they become democratic than a neat little report is released which says this. It says, when you survey the world's democracies, there are these highly pronounced patterns of unequal political influence on the basis of wealth. Systemic corruption, whether just the absence of transparency, so parties are fueled by insiders who are able to trade in influence, get favors, get access and influence and that sort of thing, or whether it's larger scale schemes 
of bribery, um, of uh, stealing money from the state purse. Either way, there was widespread corruption across the world's democracies, and that wasn't attended to in that little model of liberal democracy. Later in 2019, it becomes even clearer. Transparency International just comes out and says it. They say, look, you know, corruption isn't just bribery. It's not just that, that uh, paper bag of cash in exchange for a lawmaker voting a particular way. It's networks of entrenched influence and access for wealth, okay? And it's endemic across the world, this pattern of undue influence. Okay, and just a little tiny example of this. You can look at this across countries, but you know, how does that connect up to climate change? Well, corruption is one of the leading causes of climate change. It's one of the reasons that climate mitigation programs aren't effective. It's one of the reasons that all the development and aid money and new technologies don't get used optimally. Uh, or in this, on this slide, it's uh, a source of unequal lobbying on climate change debates such that decision makers across the world have unequal types of information from different sides of the issue. Okay, so you know, what that made me think was we were congratulating ourselves on the end of history because the Communist Party, which dominated the state and the rest of society, had lost. But in its place, it seemed like we put the market there. And not just the market in general. We put wealthy individuals and interest groups there, that the market dominates the state and the rest of society. Uh, and in the United States, we congratulated ourselves on this uh, trajectory towards equal citizenship and political inclusion. But, you know, race, sex, uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, uh, nationality, these aren't the only differences between people. In fact, socioeconomic status is one of the most relevant differences between people in any population. And that source of difference and distinction has grown so much. So we've got, what about that? You know, political exclusion on the basis of wealth or socioeconomic status. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the interest of time. Um, the point of uh, a few of these things is to say uh, that the United States embodied this plutocratic system in the slide where the market dominates the state and the rest of society. The United States has come to dominate, to exemplify that system better than most other places I've studied. Um, the cost of winning office is so high. Um, the percentage of individuals who gives office holders, candidates, and political parties, and the outside expenditure groups, the percentage of people who give them most of their money is infinitesimally small. The donor class is not only incredibly unrepresentative of the general public, uh, but they're also way more conservative on economic issues. Here's the explanation for what uh, Gillens and Page find. Um, why do we have conservative law and policy that uh, concentrates wealth? Because the people who fund campaigns, parties, and lobbyists want that. And they're a very small uh, portion of the population. Uh, there's also a long story to be told about how government buying for the wealthy became the official form of government in the United States of America, thanks to a line of Supreme Court cases from 1976 to 2014. Um, but the bottom line here is that the, United Sta the, the US Supreme Court, with its power of judicial review, declared democracy an open marketplace just constitutional interpretation, declared money as a form of protected speech and association, donation, spending, declared political equality and unconstitutional rationale for reforms. And the list kind of goes on and on um, up until 2010, where the court finally just comes out and says it. It says, democracy is premised on responsiveness, but it's talking about candidates producing political outcomes desired by financial contributors. Democracy is premised on responsiveness. This is a quote from a majority of the US Supreme Court comparing political donations to the vote and saying responsiveness to both of these, to money or to votes, is democracy in action. So prior to Trump taking office, the United States was already highly corrupt and systemically so. Um, and you know, this is part of the problem that Hillary faced. You know, when voters, especially voters in the Rust Belt, um, voters in areas to, uh, highly affected by the decline of heavy industry, by unemployment, by sinking wages, by outsourcing of jobs, when they looked at Clinton, they could see her Wall Street speeches. They could imagine her to be in the pockets of Wall Street banks, of Clinton Foundation donors, of her campaign contributors who actually 
outpaced Trump's. And they could say, you know, why would a working class party like the Democrats lose an election in the Rust Belt? Because they're not perceived as catering to the, to the working class, right? So that happened to her. Um, and she lost, I think most notoriously and importantly, she, vo she lost the vote for needed change. You know, Trump got the usual conservative voters, the religious voters, older voters, uh, voters without a postgraduate degree, that sort of thing. But who he really, really got, besides evangelicals, was people who were doing worse than before ac economically, people who were experiencing economic insecurity. Uh, who he really got were people who said life for the next generation of Americans would be worse than for the current generation. He got people who said most of all this election is about needed change. And I don't care that he doesn't have the right temperament. Right? The disruptor point is highly valid uh, in exit surveys. So, uh, you know, it's not supposed to be this way. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Oh, really? It had to be this way. I mean, I know, I know. He won by a minuscule margin in a bunch of key states. It could have gone the other way. Of course, Russian hackers, fake news, biased algorithms, data theft, Cambridge Analytica, they miss, they're missing 10 other forms of corruption. The voting rights restrictions, of course, there's all these different factors. But this isn't an accident. Cause and effect. All right? And so there's something to be said for going into this hell that we created prior to Trump, this plutocracy. Now, switching gears just a little bit. Um, if we've looked at Trump that way, cause and effect, then we might even say he's pointing the way forward, right? He's not just the obstacle. We've got to learn from this guy. So what happens uh, with Trump? Um, well, I mean, imagine becoming the president of the United States of America and during your campaign having said, the president can't have a conflict of interest. I can retain my hundreds of businesses. OK, so maybe my adult sons will exercise daily control, but they'll still talk to me. And I don't have to divest myself. I don't have to put things in a blind trust. Imagine saying, oh, yeah, presidents have always released their tax returns. Um, Jimmy Carter divested himself from the peanut farm. But I don't have to divest myself from the global empire. I'm not even going to release my tax returns. Um, I'm going to put my children and my inner circle of cronies from my <laughs> highly fraudulent and corrupt business career. I'm going to put these guys in key places. Um, I'm going to use the pardon power liberally because when members of my network get caught, they need to know, they need to have assurances from me that they're not going to do jail time for it. So they can be loyal to me and I'll reward them, right, with impunity. Um, and then when his tax returns finally do come out, you've got to read the New York Times articles on this. But they established that the vast influence trading network we knew was going on is real. And the details are salacious and incredible. Um, so check that out. Uh, Nicholas Confessore in the New York Times, um, the release of the tax return. So Trump came to power even though all of this was, except maybe the details of his tax returns, all of this was right out in the open, right? Okay. Um, and he's, he comes to power on the heels of a plutocracy. What does he do? Well, he says, you know, who's going to be part of my cabinet, part of my government? People who made a fortune. He can improve on the plutocracy. He can make it more efficient for purposes of wealth maximization by putting interested parties in charge of the key areas of U.S. policy in the executive branch. He can improve on it, essentially, by cutting out the middlemen. Because elected office holders in the United States, of course, there's some good ones. Of course, there's shades of gray, but they had become middlemen between special interests and, and law and policy. You know, it's just a fact of life in the United States. But Trump said, you know, it's way more efficient if we just do this stuff ourselves. So he put himself, his family members, his inner circle in charge. And that's uh, how kleptocracies work when you look across the world. It's, it's a well-known model. So government by thieves for the purpose of private plunder. Here's some definitions personal gain at the expense of the governed, concealment of illegal gains. And one of the ways they do this, this is so Trump, is the instability of the political uh, and economic agenda. With so much chaos in the media coming through his, his speeches, his, his press apparatus, there's so much chaos. Who's really got 
the focus and the quality of mind to get to the heart of the matter, right? We've, I feel like all of us lost about 20 minutes from our attention span over the last four years, in addition to depression and anxiety and outrage. <laughs> anyway, um, and the, the, the other thing about the kleptocracies is they can be wicked. So in the book, I give some details about how that infamous child detention and child separation policy that he maintained <laughs> wasn't just problematic for reasons of, oh, I don't know, children's rights and parents' rights and human rights um, and migrants' rights and immigration law. It was also highly, highly repulsive for a different reason, which was the people who operated the private detention camps where the parents and the children would go made millions. And they happened to be donors to his inauguration <laughs> and to his super PACs. So the kleptocracy spares no one and it's its repulsiveness really knows no limits. Um, okay, so in other words, Trump improved on this model of corruption from plutocracy to kleptocracy. And this is what had me thinking of, okay, you know, can Trump still be our teacher? <laughs> because what he's done is so extreme and it's so repugnant. Uh, and there's that old adage though, right? That sometimes things have to get worse before they can get better. Um, and I know, it's another, it's like the end of history or something. Why is this guy giving us more cliches? Uh, this one is, has some rootedness, though, um, in the issues. So sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Uh, when you look back at human history, right, you go back to the agricultural revolution if you want. You can go further. But around 11,000 years ago, obviously, human settlements grew once we got those rudimentary technologies for farming. Uh, for agriculture and so on, for livestock and so on. We, we developed, eventually, settlements and large-scale political systems, right? That's when political systems in that broader sense that we use today became possible. Um, and over thousands of years, they turned not just into kingdoms, but into empires. Political power would get more and more concentrated and eventually there were empires ruling over 10% or more of the global territory. Uh, and it was a long time coming, I think, uh, in the Enlightenment when political philosophers got to the heart of this stuff. They started to see clearly, and they started to see a particular design in all of this because these large scale societies almost always had slaves. They almost always had patterned, entrenched roles for different people in the hierarchy, women, uh, different, different castes and categories of men and women and aristocracies and royalties and all these things. And yet, eventually, along came these Enlightenment thinkers who questioned authority structures. Uh, John Locke is one of them. And they used, I think, you know, one of the magic of people from the Enlightenment period, right, 18th, 17th century, uh, political thinkers is they came across some charged words. And I think these charged words, one of them is tyranny, and that's why it's in the title, are there to wake people up. So, you know, if, if I say Trump is making things worse and they have to get worse in order for them to eventually get better, it's because there's a certain point at which human beings cease to tolerate injustice. There's a certain point. Piketty talks about it as well. Remember that little quip that the United States had reached levels of inequality that before had triggered violent revolutions? Well, Piketty says, you know, the maintenance of such inequality is the function of the oppressive apparatus, jails, police forces, and even more so the ideological apparatus, the justifications for all of this inequality. So during the Enlightenment, political thinkers start to see through this stuff. And John Locke says, <clears throat> tyranny is tyranny is the exercise of power beyond right, not for the good of those who are under it, but for one's own private, separate advantage. And he goes on, because a lot of people would say, yeah, yeah, we're in this period where the monarchy is getting weakened, and pretty soon there's going to be the first English Republic, and Charles I is going to get executed, and uh, I don't know, there's the, going to be a ragtag band of colonists fighting a war against our good king. Uh, Locke says, it's a mistake to think that this fault of tyranny is proper only to monarchies. 
He noted that other forms of government are liable to tyranny as well, for wherever the power is put in any hands for the government of the people and is made use of to impoverish, harass, or subdue them, there it presently becomes tyranny. So there's a level, right, at which the people are being impoverished, harassed, or subdued, and there's a level at which that leads to revolution. Now, of course, you know, people tend to focus on the gory details. Uh, this is the first time that any subject of the English crown ever dipped their handkerchief or their garment in the blood of their decapitated ruler. Fun fact. This uh, is the first time uh, that the, the, British monarch, the British Empire loses in, in such a significant way. Uh, so, you know, we're going to think, oh, it's all about violence, right? But it's not about violence. It's about a particular understanding that eventually crystallizes. What did they say about Charles I, right? So he had dissolved parliament. He had waged civil wars against parliamentarians and their supporters. Um, and after the, his defeat, parliament accused him of treason and tyranny. And they defined tyranny as <clears throat> wicked designs, wars, and evil practices. <clears throat> and they said that his crimes were carried out for the advancement of a personal interest of will and power. That he pretended a prerogative to himself and his family against the public interest, the common rights, liberty, justice, and peace, by, uh, and against those uh, with, who had entrusted him with power. Um, so it's essentially abuse of entrusted power for private gain that crystallizes um, in 1649. And the High Court of Justice declares him, after a trial, a public enemy to the good of the nation, and that uh, he had pursued an unlimited and tyrannical power to rule according to his will. You get the drift, right? They reached a point at which they were fed up, where it was just too much. And the Declaration of Independence in 1776 is the same sort of sentiment. It says, a long chain of usurpations and injustices. You know, it wasn't just one tyrannical act. It wasn't just one unjust act. It was a widespread and systematic pattern of being subdued, oppressed, and harassed, and dominated, right? And I think that's where Trump is taking us, is towards a moment of revolutionary change, a change in consciousness, and potentially, see, here's the interesting part for us, right? We were saying things aren't supposed to be this way, but that's a really passive formulation. Right? That's the passive tense. What's not supposed to be this way? Things aren't supposed to be this way. What about you? Right? Where's the I in that sentence? Where's the we in that sentence? So that's a passive formulation of we're entitled to something better than this. And what revolutionary moments in political history say is you're not unless you decide you are and you do something about it. Right? So it's a testament to collective movements that end up producing changes in legal and political structures. But the very first element of that revolutionary process is a change in awareness. Again, this is why Trump is uh, so powerful and poignant to me. So, I mean, since Greek Athenian democracy, political thinkers have been warning against oligarchy government by the few for purposes of money making. It's not like Trump just came up with this stuff. We've known about it for thousands of years, right? Think about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It was the privatization of government. Access to the emperor and to all of his favors, laws and policies became a marketplace. That's what happened to ancient Rome. And belief in the civic system and reciprocity and duty and your countrymen and countrywomen declined just like it did in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. Now, so what, what is the historical haze that I'm talking about? It's a moment where that finally crystallizes. So for example, when Thomas Jefferson, after fighting, well, not fighting, but designing and being the architect of the Declaration of Independence and, and being essential to the success of the Revolutionary War, um, Thomas Jefferson says, <clears throat> just a few decades later, that the country was headed towards a single and splendid government of an aristocracy founded on banking institutions and moneyed in corporations, and that the result would be the end of freedom and democracy, and that the few will be ruling and riding over the plundered plowman and beggar. It's a lot like Piketty's statistics if you had to put them into 19th century verse, right? 
And Theodore Roosevelt makes a similar observation. FDR makes a similar observation. And it just keeps going. But there's never a moment where it fully crystallizes, where people band together as a collective with that revolutionary consciousness and awareness and demand systemic, structural change. And there's a reason why we don't do that. That's what the historical haze is all about. You know, why did monarchy last so long? Why did theocracy last so long? Why did the enlightenment take so long? And the answer, I think, is that most people in most places, in most moments of history, are unconscious politically, most unconscious politically most of the time. We, we become accustomed to the way things are. So American plutocracy in the United States, self-interest, competition, winning at most any cost, using the law adversarially to stretch it to its widest margins, to do whatever it takes, because your opponent's going to do the same thing. Right? It just becomes ingrained. And so Donald Trump, rather than a lawbreaker, becomes the most successful of this vast array of greedy and unscrupulous people. And he's rewarded for it in a way. But as things get as bad as they have, I'm, I'm actually optimistic that there's going to be change. And what does that change look like? So, so there's a, a shift in consciousness. The historical haze goes away. Suddenly you see your reality that actually, wait, we live in under, under a tyrannical form of government. It's not just monarchy and theocracy and dictatorship. It's also plutocracy. And that change in consciousness, collectives band together. But what do they ask for? They ask for structural change. And it's happened before. So why aren't we living in a theocracy? Uh, well, there's a separation of church and state. It's not just a change in attitude. That there's a structural limitation on the ability of organized religion to command law and policy. Why aren't we living in a monarchy uh, or a formal aristocracy of title. Uh, well, there's still elements of that, but it's ruled out by a separation of powers because no one leader can capture for him or herself the full powers of government. And the, the political history of the separation of powers speaks about this, avoiding another incarnation of monarchy. So what's missing today is this third separation. We have a plutocracy. Trump was able to create a kleptocracy because we have no similar separation. Wealth can still reliably and powerfully translate into political power. So um, there's a bunch of elements for what I think a, a separation of business and state would entail. There's massive public support for this across party lines, which is interesting. Um, I won't belabor the details right now. They're, they're in the last chapter of the book. Um, but Trump essentially shows us the way to all of the vulnerabilities you'd need to patch up if you wanted to be back on the path that, that desisted in, 19, in the early 1970s. If you wanted to be back on that path to completing the civil rights movement, this is where you might resume, in addition, of course, to working on those, impar those partial victories for women, African Americans, immigrants, and so on. You'd want to cement those victories, but this part just hasn't been done yet. Um, so yeah, the, at the end of the day, the book becomes very hopeful because what, what, I, what I hope it does <laughs> for people is to say things like this, right? That history is not over. Um, that history doesn't end unless people say it's over, unless people abdicate their role. And that our moment of history isn't just apocalyptic and tragic, it's also tremendously important and exciting. There's a role that, that we could be called to play if we're willing to look at it that way. Um, so that was the, uh, the endeavor that, that I tried out in the book, and you all can tell me if it works or not. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time.